So one of the points I've made throughout the discussions of Android is this concept that it's a layered architecture. And so what we're going to talk about now, we may not get through the whole thing today, but we'll start it today and we'll finish it on Monday easily, is what is a layered architecture? How is it represented from a more formalized or systematic perspective in terms of a pattern? What are the layers in Android, which some of which you already know? Um, and then maybe more importantly than what the layers are, why are there layers in Android? What's the motivation for doing this? So quickly, what's a layered architecture? You've all seen layers in other places in life, right? Anytime you have a, a parfait, you know, you might have layers. Uh, you go look to the, the pyramids, there's layers. If anybody here has taken the networking course, you've undoubtedly run across layers because networking is about layers, if nothing else, right? It's all about layers and layered architectures. Some layered architectures have seven layers, some layered architectures have four, and so on. And the typical layers in a network are the, the lower layers, which handle the physical interactions with the hardware, the encoding, and the A to D kinds of transformations. And you see stuff like you know, GSM or DSL or Ethernet or other things that are taking the world by storm, like LTE. The middle layers in a stack are really responsible for moving packets around across between processes and hosts and routers and so on, kind of the flow of data through the internet or through a network, and then maybe try to give some reliability on top of that. That's the internet layer and the transport layer. The upper layers are used to implement and interact with applications, so various things for encoding the data to keep track of differences in hardware instruction byte order, or being able to communicate over point-to-point -point links, and so on and so forth. And applications and, and middleware mostly just deal with the upper layer stuff, <laughs> right? So here are some classic examples of applications from a networking point of view, like FTP, file transfer protocol, Telnet, R login, SSH, SMTP, SNMP. These are all application layer protocols that are doing networking-centric kinds of things. When I started out in this world many, many years ago, that's all there was, right? The, the networking applications were FTP, remote login, and email. That was all you got. And of course, a lot more things have happened since then. There's also middleware for enterprise systems, which have layers, slightly different layers, but they're layers nonetheless. And they basically go beyond what the OS provides and the protocol stack provides to give you more services to enable you to build distributed applications, which is different from trying to do you know, FTP, much more complicated stuff. Um, the lower layers that you find in a middleware stack really deal with encapsulating the underlying hardware. It, thinking just for a second about our Android picture, right? this would be the hardware layer would be the Android you know, components, right? like sensors and transceivers and memory, pretty typical, but mobile device centric. The operating systems and protocols, that's obviously Android Linux. The host infrastructure middleware, that would be some of those lower layer things we saw in the middleware, like the virtual machine, the execution environment, the libraries, um, and so on. And then if you move up the stack in this world, you find some middle layers that are used to allow you to be able to build distributed applications more readily, so you have common services, you have ways of making distributed object calls, you have ways of being able to pass messages around, various kinds of ways of interacting through HTTP port 80 websites and so on. Then you have some domain specific middleware services where we're now into like the healthcare domain, the industrial internet of things domain, the flight worthy avionics domain, right? These are not the kind of stuff you'll find off the shelf, but they're things that are more specialized for particular domains. And applications typically deal with multiple layers in this world. They, they often don't just write to the top layers. They may be written to a virtual machine. They may work atop some kind of distribution middleware. They may be more customized for a particular application domain, et cetera, et cetera. The key point there is that layering is very ubiquitous, that, and you'll find it almost everywhere you look. In fact, it's so common that people have taken the time to document it as a pattern. Right? So we've talked about patterns before. We talked about you know, Observer and in 251 or other courses you've hopefully learned and remembered you know, proxy and template method and um, bridge and all those good things. So layers 
is also an architectural pattern. It appeared in the Pattern-Oriented Software Architecture series. And basically, it, it provides, this is the definition of what a, the layers pattern is. It's a structural organization schema for software systems that will provide a set of predefined subsystems. In other words, it breaks things up into pieces that are typically layered, specifies their responsibilities. In other words, what capabilities they provide, what they expect from things below them, what they provide to things above them. And then there's also rules and guidelines for organizing the relationships between these different roles at different levels of abstraction. Um, and you can read these books or take a look online to find out more about this. Here's typically what a layered architecture looks like. And this should hopefully be recap for most of you, but it's, it's worth understanding because it's so fundamental in our field. So you've got layers, no surprise there. And those layers provide a bunch of functions. And as you can see from the picture here, uh, a higher layer will typically utilize the services or capabilities of a lower layer. So that's what layer A is a lower layer, layer B is a higher layer. And they typically utilize the services by making calls on, on functions. I'm using the word function here loosely. It could be methods or messages or whatnot. It's functionality bundled together in some relatively abstract way. And you've got interactions from one layer to another only through the functional interfaces, ignoring the details of the layer implementation under the hood. And these layers are then decomposed into subtasks that live at a particular level of abstraction. Now, this is a very obvious concept once you've been exposed to it. Um, and why do we do this stuff, right? Why is this so time-honored? This is one of the most fundamental patterns in the existence of software. And the reason for doing this is to help simplify stuff, development and evolution of software. So the, the alternative, the anti-pattern that the layers pattern is striving to replace and improve upon is what we often call big balls of mud. And in fact, that is not just my term. That's a term of art. If you go here, you can read about big ball of mud. And uh, back in the day, and, and sadly in many real systems today, the software is designed as a big ball of mud, right? So it's a spaghetti-laden tangle, a web of gobbledygook, where there's like it's like a Mobius strip. There's no beginning and no end. And anytime you make a change anywhere, everything breaks, and it's just a horrible mess. And of course, we would prefer, if at all possible, not to have to write this code. There's only one reason why you would ever write code like this. What is it? Caleb. So interdependency might be one issue. I'm, I'm looking for a more um, sort of you know, smart alecky answer. What's the reason you would write code like this? You don't know how to do it better. That, that's actually the real reason. But, but if, you were in, if, if you knew better and you wrote the code like this, what would be the reason? Job security. <laughs> so <laughs> the reason you might write code like this is that you don't want anybody to be able to replace you. <clears throat> and there's, there's famous stories of people writing, you know, like, this code is cursed, you know, like don't go near it, like, like the army of the dead in uh, Lord of the Rings. So I'm, I'm being facetious, obviously. You should always write good code, but sometimes I wonder if people do it like that. Um, and, and what you want instead of big balls of mud with all the functions strewn all over the place is something that's more modular. And that's the key of this, modular that supports extension and contraction. So you want to be able to make changes up and down the, the layers. Now, this all sounds fine in, in theory. When practice, it's a little tricky, right? So the tricky part, and why people sometimes are tempted to write this kind of code, this goes back to what Caleb was saying, um, is because if you're not careful, you can end up with a lot of overhead moving stuff back and forth between the layers. And that's one reason why in layered architectures, you'll often see things like this, where a higher layer can zip over and skip an intermediate layer and talk to the lower layer. And that's almost always for performance reasons. For example, right, you know, if you think about, just to give you a quick analogy to what we've talked about all semester, if you think about where Java 8 is, right, we've got Java 8 uh, parallel streams, we've got Java 8 completable futures, those are kind of the higher layer abstractions, if you will. Sometimes, for various reasons, that's not sufficient. So they don't tell you in Java, sorry, gotta deal with what we give you, there's nothing else, if it's not parallel stream, it's nothing. 
Instead, they have layered architectures. So you can spawn a thread if you need to. You can create fork join tasks and feed them to the common fork join pool if you need to. And sometimes there's a great need for that. Like if you're writing a runtime environment for another VM language like Akka or Scala, then you don't want to use parallel streams. That makes no sense. You want to use the abstractions that are lower level. So there are reasons to get through there, reasons to jump across the layers. And the main thing you want to do often is, is avoid overhead. And that's the killer, in, especially in concurrent and parallel programs. Context switching, synchronization, data copying. Those are some of the things that motivate our current fixation on reactive programming, for example, to get around some of those problems. All right, well, given that is a very abstract background, let's just talk uh, briefly about Android's layered architecture. And obviously, it has layers. I think you've seen that by now. Um, the kernel layer controls the hardware and manages the low-level system resources, right? like virtual memory and various um, access to processor cores and network communication. And it makes sure those things are shared in a coherent and non-corrupted way. The layers of middleware we talked about kind of abstract away from these low-level details, which, while they're portable, are tedious and error-prone to program. So they provide you with higher-level abstractions, like activity managers and package managers and telephony managers and window managers and so on. And then, of course, the applications leverage all this stuff to actually do something useful. This is often, this way of doing things is sometimes called the framework and apps model. And iOS and Android are great examples of framework and apps. Why do we have layering? So this is really the, the key thing. So let, let's assume we've got layers, right? Why do we have them? Well, one of the most important reasons is systematic software reuse. Because the people who built Android didn't want to have to build an operating system for the most part. They, they, they did, but they started with something that already existed, Android Linux. The people who build applications, well, let me rephrase. So people who built Android didn't want to have to build a whole operating system. So they took something and used it with its system call interfaces largely intact. The people who built Android's runtime environment didn't want to have to rebuild um, the concept of a virtual machine. So they started with something and they tweaked it a little bit. They didn't want to have to rebuild all the libraries that already did many of the things in Java. So they shamelessly copied the, the structure, sequence, and organization of those things and reused them. They didn't want to have to rebuild all the native libraries for doing you know, font management and databases and uh, other kinds of things that you get, you know, graphics, 3D graphics, 2D and 3D graphics. So by building things in a layered way, they were able to reuse a lot of stuff that was already there, and they could reuse them in a way that was organized, right? There was a, there was a structure to it, so it was easier to understand, easier to maintain, and so on. LibC provides a common API. You wouldn't want to have to reinvent a new API for Linux. That would be crazy, so reuse the one that's there. You want to be able to take advantage of multi-core, so reuse the abstractions that Java provides for that, shamelessly copying the structure, sequence, and organization. You can also do some plug and play replacements of layer implementations. So um, by having things layered, you can change the hardware and only have to change the hardware abstraction layer or device driver implementations without changing the way that the application frameworks, virtual machine, applications run, because those things are shielded from the changes in the implementation detail by the layer boundaries. So in a sense, you can confine, you know, you can put, put the uh, implementations in a cell and keep them from escaping and causing harm to other parts of your code, right? You can encapsulate them so that implementation changes don't break a lot of stuff. Very important goal in big software. Uh, another key theme here is to reduce the surface area of the APIs that application developers must understand. So no application developer in the right mind wants to get anywhere near the details of virtual memory management and page table management and scheduling the threads on the cores and dealing with IO interrupts. That's ridiculously complicated. So instead, there's an operating system API that abstracts all those things away to create processes, create threads, lock things, and so on. And the same concept goes up and down the stack, right? That's what's called a facade. You, you encapsulate lots of complexity with a simpler surface area that's easier to understand, easier to grasp. And of course, another reason for using layers is to leverage all these popular protocols, TCP IP, APIs, Linux system call API, Java library platform API, programming languages like Java, et cetera, et cetera. 
All these things can be leveraged, you know, C++ and C where it makes sense. All that stuff can be leveraged and not have to relearn everything from scratch. So those are some of the benefits of layering. And a lot of this stuff is available in open source form under various licenses. All right, so that was just a quick overview of layered architectures. Um, so make sure you understand the concept and probably a good idea to have a fairly good understanding of some of the layers, at least in terms of their high level behavior, because those tend to show up on quizzes.